Mr. Vice President, Friday night you declared an end to what you smilingly called the war with the network, saying you'd achieved a modicum of success. Why the end of the war? Well, actually, it never was a war. Actually, what happened was uh, some of the things I said uh, gave rise to certain fears. I wanted to uh, allay those fears uh, to the extent that I made it perfectly clear that there would be no continuing effort to harass or criticize the networks. I think the awareness based on the public response has made the networks uh, certainly cognizant of the fears of the American people that a broader diversity of opinion is necessary. So I think I've achieved my objective. From CBS Washington, in color, Face the Nation, a spontaneous and unrehearsed news interview with the Vice President of the United States, Spiro T. Agnew. Vice President Agnew will be questioned by CBS News correspondent Bruce Morton. Hugh Sidey, Washington Bureau Chief of Time Magazine, and CBS News correspondent George Herman. Mr. Agnew, you never struck me as the kind of man who would advocate unilateral withdrawal. I take it, therefore, you think you have achieved a kind of victory in, in your struggle for a change in the media. Well, it wasn't really an, an effort to achieve a victory. I simply saw, uh, perhaps coming about unwittingly, an undue focus on one type of opinion. And I thought it was necessary to point out that there were other opinions within the country, certainly revealed by the support for the president's program in Vietnam, that weren't being given sufficient attention. Once having said it, once having evoked the public response, I see no necessity for continuing it, because obviously I was never advocating censorship. Uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, you have been listed as the third most popular man in the nation by Mr. That was Gall last week. Mr. Gallup, yes, indeed, <laughs> and even on the best dressed list. And uh, I see books in the book uh, stores around the country on you. Uh, are you pleased with the image, uh, your image, as it's emerged in this time? Well, I'd have to be uh, uh, pretty devious if I didn't say that I thought my image had been improved uh, over what it was at the end of the campaign. Uh, I don't regard these things with a great deal of uh, permanency. Images change from day to day, and uh, the public generally adjusts its conception of a man based on what he's doing and what it sees of him. I would hope that what I do in the coming months and what I say uh, will enable me to uh, increase my acceptability among all Americans. How, Mr. Vice President, do you explain the rather favorable image that uh, seems to be created by, of you by the same media that uh, you criticized rather harshly several weeks ago in their, uh, in their, uh, the picture they cast of the dissent leaders? Well, I, I really don't know exactly how to answer that except to say that when fairness of anyone is called into question, he generally leans over backward to be fair. Perhaps I've had uh, some pretty good treatment lately as a result of that gen genuine American reaction to, to be extremely fair. Uh, but I think mainly uh, it's put me in the public eye a little bit more and people have looked in a little more depth at what I've said rather than rely on uh, the usual practice of excerpting what might be able to be converted to the most sensational news. One of In other words, people did see uh, the entire speech I made concerning the networks because it was put on live TV at prime time. Uh, without that, and with simply excerpt reporting of what I'd said, uh, the same impression might not have come through. One of the taglines that said that been associated with you since this series of speeches uh, on demonstrators, on the media, and so forth, uh, pictures you as a kind of uh, champion of uh, middle America or the silent majority or whichever of those phrases you like. Do you, do you think that's accurate? Is that your constituency? Well, I think uh, middle America is a phrase that uh, has sort of become uh, in common usage because of the fact that so much attention has been paid to the fringes of America. I don't look at middle America as a, an equal segment of American society to be weighed against the opinion on the left and the opinion on the right. I look at middle America 
uh, as encompassing that broad spectrum of people who may be very liberal on one subject, very conservative on another, who do not consider themselves political activists every day, but who are only interested in uh, the principles that the country uh, runs by and the continuation of the American way of life. So I'd say if you look at it uh, within the limits of that definition, uh, yes, I think I appeal to, to middle America. I, I think most people in government who don't take extreme views appeal to middle America. It's also been said uh, that in political terms, your appeal is particularly strong uh, in the South, uh, or perhaps to the, to the people who might otherwise have gone for George Wallace, that you've pulled votes away from him. Do you think that's an accurate reflection of uh, what you've done? Well, I think I do have an appeal in the South. I'd be dishonest if I said I, I didn't think I did. And I think it comes about not because I'm expressing any uh, extremist philosophies, but because I have not been quite as careful about uh, being misunderstood and exploited by uh, certain left extreme groups who, uh, who utilize uh, any compassion for the unique problems of the South and for what I consider uh, the undue untoward victimization of the South uh, at the expense of uh, achieving the objectives that we all know we must achieve in the, in the field of uh, desegregation of our society. So yes, I, I would say I, I do appeal to the South because I'm not afraid to, to support the South, uh, uh, to understand the South, to assist the South in reaching the objectives uh, set forth by the courts uh, in a way that's least disruptive. This is February 1st, a day which many Southerners have told us is a particularly black day for them. It's the effective date of the Supreme Court's ordered integration. Does the administration, are you doing something or do you have something underway which is going to make life a little easier for the Southerners so that when the next election comes around, you'll be able to go to the South and say, look, we tried our best? We don't regard it in that light. Uh, we're not trying to make life easier for anybody. We're all trying to live under our system of laws and representative government. And let me emphasize and, and make very clear that when the courts of this country speak, uh, the executive branch of the government and this administration will perform its obligations under the Constitution. It's ridiculous to be an advocate of law and order in one sense and attempt to circumvent it in another sense. But there are ways uh, in which the Alexander case, which you refer to, which uh, was recently came out of the Supreme Court and forbade the uh, uh, delay of uh, uh, certain uh, parts of the Green case, the freedom of choice uh, overruling case, uh, to be put off until September term. There are ways that this can be done. And the president has indicated to me that he will shortly announce the formation of a cabinet level group uh, which I will chair uh, that will work for the purpose of implementing the decisions of the court in the least disruptive way to quality education in the South. Uh, as an ancillary uh, portion of this particular group, there will be formed a task force on education which will consist of distinguished Southern educators of both parties and both races who will work with the school districts having the most difficulty to achieve the spirit and the letter of the court decisions in the way uh, that might least impair uh, the continuance of quality education in those districts. Well, the work of, of this committee, though, those decisions is, is, is busing. That's the, what all the heat's about these days in Florida and South Carolina and a number of other states. That's something that you have said you, you personally are not in favor of. Are you going to have to go down now as let me Let me clarify my my statement on busing, there's nothing more complicated than busing and, and uh, nothing that really lends itself uh, in a more difficult sense to accurate definition. There, there are all kinds of busing. There, there's busing to achieve a racial balance. There's busing to prevent a racial balance. Uh, there's busing in the traditional sense that uh, high school children uh, usually come from an area that's larger than that in which they can comfortably walk. And the Congress has spoken not too long ago to say that uh, busing for the purpose of, of achieving a racial balance alone without uh, any proof that uh, segregated uh, attitudes exist in the community uh, shall not be lawful. We've got to look at each school district to see whether dual systems are there 
that attempt to prevent integration of the system or to see whether uh, segregated patterns are arising uh, by election of the people in spite of efforts to prevent them. Uh, we've got to look at each busing situation on its own merits and make our decisions as a result of what we see. Uh, I think it's, a, it's wrong to speak of busing as a general term because we must define what kind of busing we're talking about. The kind of busing I don't favor is a busing to achieve a racial balance, which the Congress has already said, uh, ha has already prohibited under the law. But to get back to this committee, which you are going to chair, this cabinet level committee, this is going to work to implement, to help schools implement the Supreme Court's ruling? Is that the way that's, it's operated? That's the idea. Yes. Well, with, it with money or with organization or how? Well, no, simply by uh, uh, receiving the reports of the task force that I mentioned and uh, attempting to guide the district in coming into conformity with, uh, with the decisions. Now, when you attempt to abide by a court decision, it's not always easy to decide what is compliance with the decision. And there's been a great amount of dispute on this. Sometimes the Department of HEW hasn't agreed with, uh, uh, with the court uh, interpretation. Sometimes uh, the, the citizens in the area don't agree with it. Sometimes outside parties interested in the performance of the law, uh, such as the NAACP or others, don't agree. And what we want to do is to bring into existence a task force consisting of all these people where we can sit down and reach accord through dialogue and discussion and at least uh, understand uh, what we're This is sort of a conciliation council. In, in a sense, it's a council to, to reach a core through discussion doesn't, and dialogue. Mr. Vice President, doesn't this uh, run into a little conflict with the existing apparatus and HEW and justice? Doesn't that uh, with well, such no, a... HEW and justice will each be a part of this mm -hmm. cabinet level group that I'm going to chair. The Attorney General will be a member of the group. It's the not Secretary meant of to, HEW will to be replace a member of the group. that machinery then. No. No, this is, this is a, a, a decision level uh, advisory type of situation. This is, a, this is a top level group to attempt to bring the, the restoration of, uh, of uh, quality education to those districts who feel that in the constructions previously given to the uh, decisions of the court, uh, they've suffered to some extent. What I don't understand, the reason I'm kind of floundering on this is because people like Governor Kirk of Florida have assured us that there isn't the money, there isn't the physical resources to do what the Supreme Court ordered. Now, I, I'm not quite clear in my own mind what your committee is going to do well, to overcome that. Let me just say this, that there is a great amount of understanding, a misunderstanding, um, about what the purposes of the decision are, and Governor Kirk's uncertainty uh, proves this and is a good reason for bringing about the kind of dialogue that this group is going to bring about. Now, obviously, it's a very difficult assignment and uh, hardly one that would be expected to, uh, to further my uh, image enhancement that you mentioned at the beginning <laughs> of the questioning, but it's one that I uh, take on with a great amount of uh, of enthusiasm because I think that much of the difficulty that's come about has been through misunderstanding of what the court really meant and what the people have taken out of the court statements and uh, what the Department of HEW and the Attorney General's office may have uh, promulgated just, in the way of regulations. Let me just fish for one more detail. You and the Attorney General, the Secretary of HEW? On and, the committee? and probably s several of the President's counselors, uh, possibly uh, Mr. Moynihan, uh, possibly Mr. Harlow and others. Mr. Mr. Vice, Vice President, President uh, if I switch over to another subject, uh, one of the other things you're going to be doing, we're told, is uh, leading the political battle this fall for the Republicans. Uh, where do you see the Democrats most vulnerable? Everywhere. Uh, they don't seem to, uh, to be a cohesive force at the present time. There's a, great, there's a greater latitude and much more uh, range of opinion. Uh, politically among the Democrats uh, than I've ever seen it, which makes them extremely vulnerable. Uh, notwithstanding that, the party in power traditionally has always had a, had a difficult time in uh, congressional elections uh, while a new president uh, is, is testing and, uh, and moving his programs. But I think that uh, what President Nixon has been able to do uh, through the uh, innovations in, in his legislative proposals uh, through the fact that he has already put before the Congress uh, uh, 
some 170 new proposals in the way of legislation, of which roughly only a third have been enacted. This is not as good as President Johnson was able to do. He was able to enact about a half of his. I think that uh, the President's trying to bring about a reform in our system, and I think the people are aware of this. What about your own plans, Mr. Vice President? You've been suggested as a possible presidential contender yourself in 1972 or in 1976. How are your ambitions these days? Well, obviously, uh, I, all I want to do is be as supportive of the administration uh, as I can. I said uh, the day I was elected uh, that I would be uh, as loyal a, a vice president as any president ever had. I still feel the same way. I have great respect and admiration uh, for the President of the United States. I think he's doing a good job, and it would be ridiculous to talk about my uh, moving into a, a place where I would think of uh, opposing his reelection. Would you rule out succeeding him, perhaps? I wouldn't rule it out, but I wouldn't say I have great ambitions in this area either. Have you had any contact with the group in California that says that uh, Mr. Nixon better watch out and follow through on your promises or you may drop him from the ticket in 1972? Uh, we've answered uh, letters of that type assuring them of my total loyalty to the president. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, you uh, perhaps have read the memoirs of previous vice presidents like Lyndon Johnson and Hubert Humphrey and they seem to have passed through a very unhappy time in their vice presidency. but. You seem to be quite happy about it. Uh, do you feel that it's, it's been a worthwhile year? <laughs> it's amazing how how good it's been to be a, a vice president uh, operating with a president who causes one uh, no insecurities, uh, only provides the greatest in support, uh, maintains a proper communication at all times and uh, indicates that he learned uh, a great deal about being a vice president himself. Could you, sir, do you feel you could step in if need be tomorrow and be uh, fully familiar with all the major issues and the major problems and take over that job? Has Have, have you been briefed and fully kept up on everything? My briefing is a continuing process because I sit in all the high councils, such as the Security Council and the Urban Affairs Council, the Economic Affairs Council, and the like. Ab over and above that, the President and I uh, talk, uh, not what you'd call frequently, not on a daily basis, but uh, uh, frequently enough that I'm aware of any departures uh, in his thinking that might affect what I say. In addition to that, I consult with the top counselors of uh, the President's staff. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, <clears throat> and I do feel able uh, to take over at any time in the event of an emergency. You said <clears throat> uh, in your interview with the U.S. News and World Report in October, you said you felt there is a very conservative current run running through the country at the present time that, the, that this should help the Republican Party. Is this, when you say a very conservative, do you mean really rather far right, or did you just mean that the current was strong? I didn't mean to indicate that that the current was far right. I, I simply mean it's it's a, a, a return to the traditional American values uh, uh, of the people who represent, as Mr. Morton asked me a while back, middle America. I think this is the, the, the kind of thinking I think predominates uh, today, not, not a right-wing philosophy. I don't find any sympathy for that. The problem that's going to come up, I'm sure, in this conservative current in, in election terms is the, the promises of the administration, and one of them that I'm sure is going to come up and that you're going to be hearing a great deal about is law and order, and where is it? Yeah. I think it's there. You uh, think it has you been You just achieved? take a look at the, uh, the complexion of uh, society in the country uh, compared with last year and the year before that, and you'll see that a great amount of peace and stability has returned to the United States. We're trying to do something about the crime situation, and uh, I'm hopeful that the Congress will act on the proposals still before it that have been there for quite some time so that we can uh, move as aggressively and affirmatively as we can in this area. But I think that the average American would agree that there's a, a lot more placid atmosphere in the United States since this administration took office. More safety on the streets? Well, it depends on what you might call safety. I, I, I don't think you can uh, afford to walk the streets of a big city at night yet, uh, but I think that uh, we're tempting through not cutting the budget, 
Uh, we're attempting through our revenue sharing device, which again is still pending before the Congress, to move to do something about this. The President can't do it unilaterally. He needs the help of the Congress and I think a Congress that's more responsive than the one we have now. Mr. Vice President, uh, I was uh, leafing through some of the clippings from your Asian trip uh, last night uh, that I hadn't seen. And uh, there seems to have been some feeling back here that the, uh, the Nixon doctrine was uh, getting a different emphasis on your tour, that uh, there was more stress on uh, the United States will remain a Pacific power and less on uh, the idea of, of more Asian independence and self-help and, uh, and a smaller U.S. involvement. Do uh, you think uh, there was some shift in emphasis that you gave the, the doctrine? No, I don't think I gave it, gave it any shift in emphasis. What I think really happened was that uh, when we stressed the uh, uh, self-reliance uh, part of the doctrine, uh, the regional cooperation, uh, there were some that uh, felt that this was evidence of our desire to withdraw completely. And in responding to those questions about was the United States really getting out of Asia, uh, it would bring into natural prominence the part of the doctrine that said we would perform our treaty obligations and we would undertake such commitments in Asia that were commensurate with our interests. Uh, this does not de-emphasize the very important matter of regional economic and security cooperation and I found the Asian people very much interested in uh, a greater uh, self-reliant uh, posture for themselves and in regional cooperation, as I've indicated in subsequent statements to but the But you trip. seem to have left the impression, at least in Thailand, after Vice President Nixon has been telling us about the change to this new Nixon policy, you seem to have left a, a slightly uh, variant impression in Thailand where they came out and said there has been no change. Now, are we uh, caught in semantics here? Has there been a change toward a new Nixon policy or hasn't there been a change at all? I think that what, what I was trying to indicate and what the the Thailand situation reveals is that what was happening in Thailand was in total accordance with the Nixon policy. We have not involved ourselves with any troops in Thailand. We are providing a material assistance to them. We are encouraging their regional development and their economic growth. And uh, we're doing all the things that the Nixon doctrine calls for. So uh, Thailand was in conformity with the Nixon doctrine originally. There was no need to depart uh, or make any change in that place. Mr. Vice President, your pronouncements from over there were rather uniformly optimistic about the success of the withdrawal from Vietnam. Some in this country would challenge that, thinking perhaps we're headed for a crisis this spring. Looking back now in hindsight, do you still have the same uh, uh, feeling about it that uh, this thing is going to come off as planned by the administration? I think so long as the administration is able to uh, make the withdrawals in a manner commensurate with the ability of the South Vietnamese to provide for their own defense, we're not going to get in trouble. Uh, there are some who feel that the president may be uh, pressured into making uh, withdrawals of a more ambitious nature in, in point of time than uh, can be coped with by the Arvin troops, I'm pr pretty certain that he's not going to do that. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, for example, expressed a grave uh, fear that we might get out of Vietnam too soon. He expressed a fear that uh, a small victory uh, over an Arvin unit could be blown up to, to appear to be a total defeat for Vietnamization. And of course, gentlemen, this is where the media must undertake a tremendous responsibility. There isn't any doubt that sometime in the next year will come an offensive uh, that will uh, result in a limited victory for the North over some South Vietnamese unit. No doubt about it. They can do it. It's to their advantage to do it, and they're going to make every effort to carry it through. This doesn't mean that a military victory of any consequence has been achieved. and it's important that it not be blown out of perspective in the total effort of Vietnamization. The best way to put these things in perspective, as I think you found now, Mr. Vice President, is to get a high administration official to go right to the public on television. The, uh, the impact of this kind of thing, as you yourself have found out, as the, as the President has found out in his veto message, is perhaps the best way to establish it. Is this now a permanent part of the administration, that this might be the way to get what you want across? 
Well, presidents have traditionally gone to the public where they think the welfare of the country is, is being affected. I don't think this will change with uh, the Nixon administration or any other administration. The president gets to the public because he, after all, represents all the people, not from any one sector of the country. And he is communicating with the people the governmental decisions of the moment, which are news, hard news. Uh, so I don't think that's going to change in the future. What's happened to all those effete snobs, Mr. Vice President? Are they in hiding? Well, we ha we have or are a there few, three uh, of them here in front of you? <laughs> we have a few effete snobs around yet, uh, I would guess. Mr. Vice President, uh, the country has, I guess, ten days now in which to do something about the railroad strike that's yes. threatened. Uh, what do you expect the administration to do? Well, George Shultz has been singularly successful in being able to provide at the very last moment solutions to some of these difficult labor management problems without invoking any federal machinery. I've got tremendous confidence in his ability to do this. I guess he can't always be successful, but we're hopeful that this long-standing dispute may be uh, resolved by persuading the parties to reach accord. You'd rather Our not administration have would rather not invoke uh, governmental machinery because we feel that uh, in the final analysis that we're going to have a viable growing economy, the parties to these disputes better settle You are ready, though, themselves. to invoke it if you absolutely have to in the 10 seconds or so we have left? Well, I, I couldn't answer that. Uh, that's a qu decision oh. for the president. Very well. I'm sorry I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Thank you very much for being with us here today, Mr. Agnew, on you. Face the Nation. Today on Face the Nation, Vice President Spiro T. Agnew was interviewed by CBS News correspondent Bruce Morton, Hugh Sidey, Washington Bureau Chief of Time Magazine and CBS News correspondent George Herman. Next week, another prominent figure in the news will face the nation. Share the action when two of the top teams in the National Hockey League, the Boston Bruins and the Toronto Maple Leafs, clash this afternoon. Face the Nation originated in color from CBS Washington.